All right, here we go. In the end of the 1967 war, we are now looking at a situation in Israel of, of this. Remember, the original Israel before 1967. Now they've taken over the Sinai, Gaza, the West Bank, and the Golan Heights. Now, territories to make them a part of the nation of Israel. All right? Israel has no intention of entirely doing that at this point. All right? Now, some in Israel, some in Israel want all of this territory to actually be a part of an Israeli state. The problem with that is, and certainly not all, and the majority of Israeli politicians don't want it all, who's living in Gaza, the Sinai, the West Bank? Primarily Arabs, okay? This is where most of those Arab ref or Palestinian refugees went in the, uh, after the 1948 war. They already had primary, primarily Palestinian populations. So Israel doesn't want to absorb those populations because then that would be a demographic problem for Israel, right? Israel, as a, like a democratic state, would have a problem with that because then you'd start having a lot more non-Jews being elected into the Israeli government. So Israel doesn't want to keep them in perpetuity but the hope is for Israel that they can use these occupied territories as bargaining chips. That, for example, the Sinai, taken from Egypt, this is very important territory because it goes right up to the Suez Canal. And in the aftermath of this war, you literally have the Israeli army on the east side of the Suez and the Egyptian army on the west side of the Suez, and the Suez Canal for years to come is going to look like this, without international shipping going through because it's going to be the center of a war zone. These are Israeli troops. You've got the Egyptian army on the other side of the Suez Canal. The Suez Canal is shut down, which is going to be a crippling financial blow to Egypt. And Egypt is going to want to open that back up. And the rest of the world is going to want that open back up. And so Israel will hope that maybe one day Egypt will make a deal. Hey, in turn for getting the Sinai back, for example, maybe Israel will be recognized by its Egyptian neighbors, because it hasn't been to this point. That's the hope. But with other occupied territories, with other occupied territories, we've got other things that are going to start to happen. The West Bank, for example. When the West Bank is occupied, some of the West Bank will be taken over by Israel to be incorporated into an Israeli nation. For example, the city of Jerusalem was divided. East Jerusalem and West Jerusalem. East Jerusalem is where the old city of Jerusalem is. Some of the oldest buildings like the, the Jewish Temple Mount uh, or what the Muslims refer to as Haram al-Sharif where the, the, uh, the, the Dome of the Rock and the Al-Aqsa Mosque are on top of the old Jewish Temple site with the Western Wall. That's in the old city of Jerusalem. That was controlled by Jordan. Now it's in Israeli hands. Now it's in Israeli hands. Israel is going to destroy all the buildings in front of the, the, uh, the Western Wall and open up the plaza that we had looked at on previous days. All right? And they will also immediately begin building settlements. And here comes the next major issue in the Arab-Israeli story. If the first conflict was just over the existence of Israel itself, the second conflict was the refugee crisis and the Palestinians' belief that the refugees should have the right to return to their homes. The third major issue is going to be the, the issue of the construction of Israeli settlements in the occupied territories. Primarily in the West Bank, Israel will start to, in places that Arabs had previously lived, will start to build communities known as settlements. They will be fenced in, they'll have barbed wire fencing, and they'll have Israeli soldiers guarding them, but they will essentially be new subdivision developments. So Jews can move in to this formerly Palestinian area. Today there are hundreds of settlements in the West Bank and in former Palestinian areas. All right? This is like the next biggest issue in the Arab-Israeli conflict. As these settlers have moved in to West Bank territories, what should be done with them? But the areas are not being taken over outright. 
They will be occupied by the Israeli military for decades to come. All right? Now, today, I'm going to spoil a little bit of the story. The Sinai is back in Egyptian hands today, and we're going to talk about how that happens. The Gaza Strip and the West Bank are today still considered occupied territories to an extent. They certainly aren't a Palestinian state recognized by the international community, but they are governed by, by uh, Palestinian leadership. All right? We'll talk more about that as we go forward, but we will occasionally see, and, and you guys will probably see on the news before too long again, Israeli military having dealings in the West Bank and in Gaza because the occupation technically still continues of those regions. All right? The outcome of this war, in addition to the occupied territories, it's a disaster for the Arab states. Egypt will lose between 10 and 15,000 troops. And this is in six days. Hundreds more from Jordan and Syria will die. Israel loses about 900 soldiers. So comparatively small compared to their Arab neighbors. Some describe the Six Day War as one of the most one-sided military uh, wars of battles in, in, in history. You have a new refugee crisis being born. As the Israelis enter into the West Bank, more Palestinians will be displaced from their homes. Some of them are refugees from the first war, are now new refugees again. All of the former British mandate of Palestine is now under Israeli control. And another thing we want to talk about is the, the new relationship between the new relationship between uh, the United States and Israel. We mentioned before that the United States and Israel, in the origins of the relationship, despite what you might hear from uh, American candidates on the Republican side of the, uh, the debate, the United States and Israel have not always been close friends. The United States has not always stood beside Israel and supported everything that Israel has done. Can you guys give an example of where the United States did not support Israel? The 1948 war, the United States, uh, we supported the existence of the state of Israel, but we were not supportive of the Israelis in that war. We had an arms boycott. We weren't selling them weapons. Any other examples that the United States was not supportive of the Israeli nation? The Suez Crisis of 56. Eisenhower con uh, condemned the Israeli actions and had them move out of the Sinai. But then in 1960 and 64, we talked about Democratic presidential candidates like Kennedy and Johnson actively courting the Jewish vote. And the Six Day War in 1967, in large part because Johnson allowed it to happen, right? Like, would this war have happened if Johnson would have said, no, don't do it? We will defend you if you get attacked. Here, in fact, we can start sending our Navy to the region to help defend you. Don't attack. Don't start it. Might Israel have acted differently? They might have. They might. We don't know, but they might have. But Johnson didn't do that. Johnson essentially told Israel, you do what you've got to do, and we won't stop you. And we didn't stop them. We did not require Israel, we did not make demands for them to give back territory. We had hoped, like some in Israel, that the territories can be used as a bargaining chip for future negotiations. And we will also end our boycott of selling arms to Israel. Previous to this, we were not actually selling weapons to Israel. Israel was getting most of its weapons from France and the Soviet Union from earlier, from the 1940s and into the 50s. Yes? Was this under Johnson? This is under President Johnson, yep. Now the United States will start arming Israel. Here's a photo of an American uh, fighter jet called an F-4. This is an F-4 uh, Phantom. An F-4. This was a top-of-the-line jet that America was using during the Vietnam era. 
and we will start selling these to the nation of Israel. This is going to be a game changer for the Israeli Air Force. The Israeli Air Force that had already resoundly defeated, or soundly defeated uh, the Egyptians and the Jordanians and the Syrians, now they get one of the best fighter aircraft on the planet. And this is going to allow them to do long range, what are called deep penetration bombing runs against a city like Cairo in the years to come. This is going to be a huge advantage for the Israeli nation. Questions, comments, concerns? Yes, ma'am. Uh, 